you got your Bible this morning, you can turn with me to Acts chapter 17, and we're going to be in verse 10 here in just a second. If you're joining with us online, we want to welcome you here. We're excited that you're here. want to let you know that you can uh, go to nbcmetary.org and get a set of notes that will guide our time together. Hopefully, if you're in the house today, that you've been able to get a set of notes. We want to welcome everybody that might be uh, joining us on our podcast that are listening uh, today. And uh, this morning, as we dive into our passage, uh, we'll be getting there in just a second. I want to thank Brother Austin for leading us uh, through the, the first nine verses of this last week. Did a great job. And what I want to talk about today is, you know, as we dive into this, I was thinking about how one of the hot topics of the day revolves around what many people have been talking about, and it's this concept of cancel culture. Have you heard of this? Of course you have. It is all over our TVs today. Cancel culture uh, has been uh, back in the news even this week. And, and essentially it's, it's, it's separating oneself from a situation or particularly a person that may not be agreed with. I actually looked for a good definition of cancel culture, because we all know what it is. We all can think of specific situations that are taking place even as I speak. We can all think of those situations, but what is cancel culture? Cancel culture, or what some have called call-out culture, is a modern form of ostracism, of separating oneself, in which someone is thrust out of social or professional circles whether it be online or whether it be on social media or whether it be in person. And while cancel culture has certainly evolved because of modern day social media, I want us to understand something here today is that cancel culture has always been around. It has always been around. Think about Jesus when Jesus was being tried, remember he was tried by the Sanhedrin, but as the, the Jewish uh, people, they, they couldn't sentence anyone to death. They had to bring Jesus before the Romans. Only the Romans could do that. And so here they are, they bring Jesus before the, the governor of Judea, Pilate. And remember, they're, they're just throwing all different types of arguments at him. And Pilate tried him and said, you know what, I, I, I can't find anything wrong. But then you also had, he, he said, oh, Jesus is from Galilee? You know what? I'm, I'm off the hook now. That, that, that's Herod's territory. So he sent him to Herod, and Herod looked at him. Now, Herod wanted him to do a, a miracle or something like that. You know, he didn't really get that out of him. Jesus was quiet the whole time. And so he didn't get anything out of him. And, and so anyway, Pilate comes before all of the people. He says, I can't find anything wrong with this guy. He said, how about I just beat him and let him go? And all the people, do you remember what they did? Over and over, they screamed out, no, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And so when we think of something like cancel culture in our day and age, we have actually seen it with even our Savior. We saw last week of how jealous the Jews were in Thessalonica. We're going to put up here on the screen a, a map we have been walking through. I'm a, I, I tell folks I'm a mapaholic. I love maps. I love to know where we are in the story. And so we are in uh, Paul's second missionary journey. He started over here in the far right of your screen and he comes through, goes through Derby and Lystra. He had been to some of those places in his first missionary journey, comes through the area of uh, between Asia and Mysia, Troas. He receives a dream. Dream, uh, goes over to across crosses the Aegean Sea, goes to Philippi, and then in Thessalonica. We saw last week how in Thessalonica he goes into the synagogue, and as he's in the synagogue, he shares the gospel over three different Sabbath days. Many people come to know uh, the the Lord. Many of the Jewish people come to know the Lord, but so many were coming to know the Lord that there was a group that got jealous. And they said, well, we can't have this guy doing it. And what did they do? They formed a mob. They actually couldn't find Paul and his companions, but they found the person whose house they were staying in. It was Jason, a guy named Jason, that whom they were residing with. And, and so they rush in and they said, well, if we can't find the guys, then we'll find his affiliates. And they pull Jason out and they, you know, they, they form a mob, they form a riot. And, and, and this is how cancel culture works. It seeks 
to shut down by any means necessary. And if they don't like the message, they politicize the message. Let me give you a, a, great, a great example of this. We saw, we saw this last week, but I'll just put it up here on the screen. Acts chapter 17, verses 7 and 8. This is what they were saying. Because they're talking about Jesus and Jesus being the king. And so this was their argument. They said, they are all defying Caesar's decrees. No, they weren't. And it had nothing to do with Caesar. But if you can take something spiritual and you can politicize it, now you can really get people involved. Saying that there is another king. Is Jesus a king? Absolutely he's a king. But he's not out to rival Caesar. He's not out to do any of those things. He is to be the king of our hearts and the king of the world in general. One called Jesus. When they heard this, the crowd and the city officials were thrown into turmoil. This was the same tactic they used on Jesus. As a matter of fact, this rival king that they have. I was looking at, and, and just as I studied, you know, Warren Wearsby has a great quote and I decided to go ahead and put it in your notes because I thought it was just so powerful as it pertains to our time together today. And I want us to consider this notion is that the kingship of Jesus Christ is unlike the rulers of this world. It's not like Caesar. It's not like Herod or Pilate or anything like that. No, he conquers. He conquers with ambassadors, not with armies. See, that's what they were concerned about. Man, you're going to bring in an army? Are you guys going to you know, form something? Are you all gonna, we're going to have a revolt? We're going to have something like that? No, we're not going to have any of those things. We conquer with ambassadors, not armies. And listen to this. His weapons are truth and love truth and love. Now, why did I bring that up to you? It's because the entire chapter of Acts chapter 17 is about being ambassadors and not having an army, but having an army of servants, of people who love truth and people who love to care about others. And so that's where we come in today. I got another map that I'm going to put up here just so you can see where we are. And so Paul and Silas escape from Thessalonica. They're trying to get out because of the mob, because of everything that's taking place. And they escape 40 miles southwest to a place called Berea. It was a smaller city. And that's where we pick up today in Acts chapter 17, starting right here in verse 10. And I'm just going to read six verses right here. It says, as soon as it was night, the brothers and sisters sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. Upon their arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. And the people here, listen to this, were a more noble character than those in Thessalonica. I'm going to come back to that. Since they received the word with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily, to see if these things were so. And then see the result right here in verse 12. Consequently, many of them believe, including a number of prominent Greek women as well as men. Verse 13, but when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that the word of God had been proclaimed by Paul at Berea, they came there too, agitating and upsetting the crowd. Here you go again, cancel culture, once again. Verse 14, then the brothers and sisters immediately sent Paul away to the coast, but Silas and Timothy stayed on there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens. We're going to pick up there next week. And after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. So here's what you have. Now they're in Berea, and now you've got this, this new group of people. And this group of people, the, the scripture says that they were of a more noble character, that, that they had a, a noble reception, that, that they said, you know what, what is this that you're talking about? They didn't have all these presuppositions that they had put up, that they, there was an openness to what they were, were hearing and listening. And so here's what I want us to see, the points that we can really bring out and be able to apply to our own life, the, the prayer that we can pray for, our, for the people that are around us who need the gospel. And here's what I want you to write down. I want us to talk about genuine seekers of Christ. Genuine seekers of Christ. There's all different types of seekers of Christ. There's haphazard seekers. There's people who, who are very passive. There's people that are very involved. There's people that don't even care. 
But the ones that I want to talk about today are these seekers in Christ. Genuine seekers in Christ, number one, write this down, are eager, are eager. There we go, are eager. And so right here in chapter 17, starting in verse 11, it says, The people were of a more noble character, talked about that, than those in Thessalonica, the city that he had just come from. And since they received, don't miss this, the word of God with eagerness. Having walked through this passage and knowing what I was going to preach about, I was praying over my little girl last night before she was getting ready to go to bed. It's one of the highlights of being a parent. It's just putting them to bed. Oh, praying over them too, but putting them to bed is a big plus as well. Had the opportunity to pray over her in bed. And having walked through this passage, I said, Lord, let her be eager. Let her be hungry. Let her develop this in her heart. I got done praying and she looks up at me and she says, Daddy, what does eagerness mean? She said, what does it mean for me to be eager after I'd finished my prayer? And I said to her, I said, it means to be passionate. It means to be hungry. It means to have this deep desire to learn. And here's what I want you to, to see this morning is that genuine Christ seekers are passionate they're hungry. Uh, look, look right here. Uh, there's something that, that you, you don't want to miss. As you see kind of towards the end of verse 11, it says that they examine the scriptures daily. They were so hungry. And you say, well, what's the, what's the point about that, Dan? If you go back to Thessalonica, then you saw how Paul and Silas, they went into the synagogue, it said, on three separate Sabbaths. You see, they were going in on these different Sabbaths, once a week, if you will. And the people wanted to hear what they had to say. Now you get to Berea and the people are saying, no, the Sabbath doing this once a week, that stuff isn't going to work. We need to come back daily. We're so hungry for what you have to say. We're so hungry to pick it apart. We want to hear this daily. And I want us to be those type of people that when we come together, that we're not just coming on a Sunday morning, that we're not just saying, I'm hungry on Sunday. Man, what if you only ate once a week on Sunday? Man, you'd be a skinny person. I want for us to be a group of people that are hungry and genuine and say, you know what? I want to eat every single day from God's word because I'm passionate and I'm hungry for what he has to say to me. This eagerness, this Greek word, uh, pro, pro, uh, prothemia, it literally means, are you ready for this? With a ready and willing mind. They had a ready and willing mind. Now we'll see here in just a second that they weren't just accepting anything, okay? But they had a ready and a willing mind. They had let down their presuppositions and they are saying, you know what? We're going to take a listen. And can I just be honest with you this morning? This morning, this isn't something that can be taught, Unfortunately, I can tell you about it and we can examine what it looked like in the Berean church, but it's not something that can be taught. I can't stand up here and teach you how to be eager. I can't stand up here and teach you how to be passionate and to have a hunger for truth because some things in church are taught. Other things in church are caught. That it's something that just begins to happen. And then before you know it, that it's contagious. This is one of those things that, that, that the Holy Spirit has to do in your life. There's a little uh, sushi, sushi and hibachi uh, restaurant on Elysian Fields that my wife and I went to uh, often when we were in seminary. And it was one of those restaurants. You have your go-to restaurant. You have your go-to. You know what I'm talking about? It's like... You know, you could do something else, but you know, you love your go-to. In fact, you might even crave your go-to restaurant. This is what, this is one of those restaurants that, that we just craved. And, and before we knew it, one of the, the owners that was there began to recognize us. Some time went by, we moved out here to, to Metairie. And so now we kind of go out there. If one of us has a birthday or something like that, we say, Let, let's go out to our favorite little hole in the wall restaurant. But I just remember because we would crave it. And, and, uh, I, I actually th thinking of that when, uh, Carrie Ann had her birthday two years ago and we went there and the owner recognized us. Of course, we had kids, you know, and like, whoa, what happened? You know, bringing the whole family here. We weren't just a, a couple. We craved that restaurant. We craved it. Can I ask you this? 
What do you crave? What do you crave? I'm not talking about your favorite restaurant. You know that. What makes not your mouth water, but what entices the desire of your heart? These guys that we're studying today, they craved truth. They craved truth. And my question for all of us across here today and those that are watching with us online, do we crave truth? I have found in my own life that I crave, when, when, I, uh, when I crave something, uh, one of the reasons that I'm able to crave for it, whenever you get that craving, a physical craving for something that you eat, it's because my stomach isn't full of something else. You hear what I'm saying? When my stomach isn't full of junk food and when my stomach isn't full of something else, that's when I crave the most. I mean, that's really what fasting is all about. If you ever think about fasting, fasting is just teaching your spirit to crave the same way that your body is craving food in that moment. And so for us to be able to say, is there anything in my life that's ruining my appetite? Is there anything in my life that's ruining my appetite for God? Is there anything that's ruining my appetite for Jesus? Are there any idols in my life? Are there materialism or, or maybe the busyness of, of, of life? But there's also other things. Have I allowed some worry to creep in? Have I allowed some unbelief to creep into my life? And it begins to fill my spiritual stomach in a way that I don't crave like I used to crave. What is in that place that is keeping you from craving? As I thought about this, I thought about Lord making us hungry. A lot of times that there are things in our life that might kill our hunger and sometimes I've even been in places where religion, religion can kill our hunger for God. When we, when we take it away and we turn our eyes from a relationship with Jesus, having a relationship, loving Him, knowing Him, developing our relationship each and every day, when we begin to turn things to, to rules and regulations, and don't get me wrong, we have to have a standard, but those things come in, 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 in a way that, that they, they coexist with a relationship with Jesus. I see people who are stone cold hearted because they've replaced a relationship, a craving for Jesus and his beauty with basic religion, do's and don'ts. So I want us to hear genuine Christ seekers are eager. The second thing that I want you to write down this morning is that genuine Christ seekers are examining. They are examining, okay? And we see that right here in the middle of verse 11. We're not going to go far. It says that they received the word with eagerness, look, and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. So what they're going through is that they're, they're going to check out, see if there's any red flags here. And, and here's what I want you to understand, is that you can be eager without being naive. You can be eager without being naive. Genuine Christ seekers, they're not naive. They're hungry. They're not going to swallow something hook, line, and sinker that they don't know what it is. And this is where I, even some churches have even named themselves after the Jewish community found in this story that we're studying today. Have you ever driven down the road? Have you ever driven down the road? A lot of times I, I see them down, you know, back roads or whatever, but there are some in, in bigger cities. And you've seen a church that might say something like Berean Baptist Church or Berean this or, or Berean that. I mean, even entire congregations have named themselves over this particular passage. And what are they doing? They're implying that the name is that we examine the scriptures. We examine these scriptures. This is it's so important for us to understand. Here's what I want you to get, is that truth is truth. Well, that was profound, Pastor Dan. Truth is truth. Truth is not fluid truth. And it is pressed upon us and through the media and TV shows. Even the emojis of our phones have things that show fluid truth. Sometimes, I mentioned religion earlier, even religious beliefs that aren't in the Bible. There are people, I, I have conversations with folks all the time, and they tell me, Pastor Dan, this is the way I grew up. I grew up believing this. I grew up doing this. And it doesn't matter if you're Baptist or you're Catholic or you're Methodist or you're Episcopalian or any of those things. A lot of people have grown up with things that are tradition that have no place in the Bible. Not one place. 
if you have a belief in here today, if you have a belief, if you're watching with us online, be able to back it up in the Bible. If you're not able to back it up in the Bible, it is a red flag. And for many of you across this room, there's been a conversion, yes, to Jesus. Praise God. That's the most important thing. But there's also been a conversion of truth in your life. You believe some things growing up. And here's the hardest part is that your fa- this is this is where it really gets into us is that our family believed it. My mom believed that. My grandmother believed that. And they believed it wholeheartedly. I mean, they had well, they had something framed in the house. You know, they believed it wholeheartedly. But folks, we've got to come here today with the open mind of a Berean and say, you know what? It might not have been true if it's not in the scriptures. I'm going to challenge you on this. If you believe anything that's not in the Bible, then that's a red flag. And you should challenge me on that. If you go through the new members class, when I used to teach the new members class, now my lovely wife does that for me, but I used to look at folks and I used to say, if you hear something come out of my mouth on a Sunday morning that's not in the Bible, I want a phone call that week. I want to talk about it. I want us to get it out because truth is truth. Truth is not fluid. It doesn't change with time, not even centuries of time. Truth is is truth. And so here's what I want us to understand. It doesn't change. And we have to be careful because I've even heard well-meaning Christians talk about reading something in their Bible and saying something like this. Listen to me. This passage may mean one thing to me and another thing to somebody else. Have you ever heard that? This passage may mean one thing to me and one thing to somebody else. Now, if they're talking about how that passage resonates giving different circumstances, well, that's fine. I mean, we all have different circumstances in this room. There might be, you might be going through a challenge or, you know, then then different than someone else in the room. And so if you're reading the same passage and, 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 and it applies, it's the same passage, same truth, but it's applying different in your circumstances. That's one thing. But to imply that the Bible can mean this or mean that is, it's, it's just unwise. The Bible means what it means. And it's not our job to force interpretation. We actually have a term for that. Did you know that? If you take your presuppositions, if you take what you believe and you jam it into the passage, that's called eisegesis. But if you take that passage like we're doing today and you examine the passage and you say, okay, uh, I want to see what it says and then apply it to my life, that's called exegesis. And that's what we try to do here each and every Sunday. And and because we can twist the scriptures and make it say whatever you want. You flip to one passage and you say, Judas hung himself. And then you flip to another passage and it says, go ye therefore and do likewise. I would venture to say that you are putting your own beliefs into the passage. We can't do that. We can't do that. It's like mining. It's like searching for gold. It's like a puzzle, putting things together. And the Bereans were were seeing, what does this thing say? Surely Paul was taking them in Old Testament passage that we were talking about last week. Isaiah 53. Is this really talking about Jesus of Nazareth? Psalm 22. Is this really talking about the crucifixion? And their search was genuine. And their search for truth led them to number Three that I want you to write down, last thing for us today, is that genuine Christ seekers are evangelized. They're evangelized. This is so cool. Look at what happens in verse 12. It says, consequently, many of them believed. Hang on to that word. They trusted. They had faith in Christ, including a number of prominent Greek women and men as well. It didn't just stay with the Jews. It also went to some of the Gentiles in that surrounding town. Last Sunday, one of our Bible studies talked about the assurance of salvation. And I wish I could have been a fly on the wall. This is one of the most important topics that we could cover. They talked about in that class, you know, how do I know that I'm saved? Can I lose my salvation? And here's what I want to teach you. Is that this is why eagerness plus examination equals evangelization. 
It's simple as this. You got point number one and point number two. You add them together, you get point number three. You see what I'm saying? That eagerness plus examination equals evangelization. That eagerness, that feelings, the passion, the hunger, examination, the search for, for truth, they balance each other out. I have known men and women who had an emotional decision for Christ. It was emotional. It was an emotional experience. Powerful worship service, emotional experience, and just give them enough time, and, and they've fallen away. They've fallen away. You don't see them anymore. You're like, what happened to you? It was a great experience. Man, the worship, I lifted my hands. Man, that preaching was spot on. Well, what happened in two or three months? Where'd you go? See, what happened was that they had eagerness, but they didn't couple it with examination. And so they wind up falling away. In fact, the Bible speaks about this in the parable of the sower. There was the seed that fell on shallow soil. Remember that one? It sprouted quickly, but because there was no root when the sun came up, it scorched the plant and rendered it unfruitful. But eagerness by itself, okay, doesn't lead to evangelization. Let me do the flip side of this, though. Examination by itself can also lead you astray. You say, Pastor Dan, how in the world? How can studying, how can studying lead me away? Well, I'll, I'll tell you. Because theology by itself doesn't save anyone from their sins. Theology by itself doesn't save anyone from their sins. Over and over, we see Jesus being hounded by, you know, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But there was one other group. There's one other group. You know which other group? There's this third group that, that I'm talking about. They were called the scribes. And these guys were lawyers. Now, they weren't Roman lawyers, but they were lawyers of God's law. And they knew the scriptures. They knew them backwards, forwards, upside down, and diagonal. They knew the scriptures well. And they memorized it, and they copied it, and they devoted their whole life to it. And listen to me, and they still missed salvation. Wow. They still miss because they had a hard heart. If they had had the openness and the eagerness that the Bereans did, perhaps they would have coupled the word with what they knew with faith. And that's why without faith, it's impossible to please God. And also without faith, it's impossible to be saved. You have this eagerness, you couple it, with examination, and there's evangelization because of faith. Many of y'all know this verse, but I'm going to put it up here on the screen because it's so important. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved. That means you didn't work for your salvation. There's nothing you can do to earn your forgiveness of sin. You can't do it. You can't earn it. Stop trying. Stop trying to do all the rules. Stop trying to say, you know what? If I follow all the Ten Commandments, then I'll be, I'll be able to go to heaven. Not true. Not true. Let's study the Bible. For by grace, that means you can't earn it. You have been saved. Ah, through faith. Through faith. You have to believe. Did you see what they said? It said that consequently, verse 12, consequently many of them believed. It's by grace you have been saved through faith, that belief. And this not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. I was reading of a couple this week um, who have been dealing with some cold weather. We've been dealing with some cold weather. We were joking around some this morning before our, our Bible study time. Uh, people were saying, man, it's kind of it's kind of cold out here. We have no idea what cold really feels like, man. We have some cities on the East Coast right now that are just gotten hammered. Dallas, I saw this week, is just covered up with snow. But, you know, for us, it's cold, you know. And so I was reading about that. I was reading about a couple that faced their first winter in a new home. And as the temperatures began to drop and the house began to get a little too cool for comfort, they decided that it was time to, like we all do, flip on the heat. And when the wife went and flipped on the heat, the uh, heat didn't come on. Have you ever been in that place? You flip it, you flip the switch. Maybe you were there even this past week. You haven't turned it on in a while. You flip the switch and nothing but cold air comes out. Well, that was their situation. And so they flipped the switch. And so they said, this is not good. And so they had to get the air conditioning and heating guy. And they called him out there to help. And with a matter of minutes, the serviceman, he had diagnosed the problem. 
The young woman, she held her breath. Have you ever done that? Maybe your plumber comes out or maybe your air conditioning guy comes out and you're just holding your breath because you're like, what's going wrong? How much is this going to cost me? They're holding their breath, uh, asking that question. What's going to happen? Am I going to have to have a pretty penny? But they were so surprised to have some good news that it was a minor problem. It was simply this. The igniter was out. The igniter was out. That furnace was self-igniting, and it was designed to ignite automatically. And that tiny little thing, the igniter, was causing such a big problem. And, and it was not making the connection to kick the heater into gear because the igniter wasn't doing what it was designed to do because of a bad connection. See, the eagerness was there. The eagerness was there. It was cold, and they wanted some heat. We've all been there. But the equipment was there. That's, that's the equipment. This is our equipment that we have. This is God's word that we have. The equipment was there. And they thought something wrong was something wrong with it. But we have the scriptures. And some people think that there's something wrong with the scriptures. There's nothing wrong with the scriptures. It's simply this. It's the igniter. It's the igniter. It's faith. And once our faith makes that connection... That's when the temperature in the house is transformed. That's when the temperature in our hearts is transformed. That's like as John Wesley said when he came to know the Lord. He said that my, my heart was strangely warmed because of his faith. And that's my question for us this morning. Is do you Have you put your faith in Christ? God is looking for men and women who are eager. God is looking for men and women who will examine the scriptures, looking for truth. God is looking for men and women who will make the connection of faith and give their lives over to Him and have a relationship with Him. I don't know about you, but I want to be a genuine seeker of God.